They were great because of one thing that made them a bit different from others, and that is that they had a profound sense of who they were, and who they were were acceptable to them, and they could see clearly through their own eyes who the rest of us were because they knew who they were. That's Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. That's the reason why they were great, because they had a sense of themselves. And you've already explained how they came about getting this sense of themselves. Zora Neale Hurston, just by the act of growing up in this black town, where she began to understand that black people can do everything they need to do for themselves, she was in her own way, like Langston Hughes, a black nationalist, however you think of the word. <laughs> Both of them were, because they believed not only in themselves, but they believed in the collective, which in the United States we call black people. And they not only believed in them, but like Langston said in that in that article uh, about the, uh, climbing the mountain, that there, whoever we are is acceptable to him. We're beautiful and ugly, too. And that's what he wanted to show everybody. Zora Neale Hurston believed very nearly the same thing in a very different way. So they were different individuals with some things that they had in common. Langston Hughes was politically far to the left. Zora Neale Hurston was politically far to the right. But they had in common their love and their respect for black culture and its tradition to the degree that they decided that they would show everybody about what black culture really was as opposed to what passed as black culture. Now remember, in their lifetime, we're coming out of the whole minstrel tradition, a minstrel tradition, part of the profound irony of America, which is that black people begin a tradition coming out of their own heritage in Africa, where once a year they would make fun of their kings and other people. And then they would sit in a semicircle when they made this fun. But when white folks saw it, they simply thought it was funny. And they did not understand what was going on at all. And so they took the form that they saw and turned it into a show, which we call minstrelsy. And then the blacks began to do imitate the whites and do the same thing. But Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston knew something different about the black experience. They knew that it was an experience of some sophistication. They may have gotten the forms right, but the sophistication came in the way that the people used the language and the words. And so they decided that they would show everybody what black folk culture was really, as opposed to the show that was running at that time, uh, Green Pastures, which was written by a white person who had the same understanding uh, as was traditional. But they wanted to show what was more deep about it. And so they decided and talked about it for many years before they even started working on it, that they would show the real story of, uh, of, uh, of, of folklore, the black folklore, and what it truly meant. And that's why they started collaborating on a play called The Bone of Contention. It didn't turn out well, folks. <laughs> I would love to see The Bone of Contention be done now, uh, but not just The Bone of Contention. I would love to see The Bone of Contention as the second story inside the debate between Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston, all of it done on one stage at the same time. And then you would begin to understand the forces uh, 
that were arrayed against black artists even at the time of the Harlem Renaissance because those forces tried to control what black artists said. And Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston wanted to reflect the black experience truly so that when you looked at it, you saw their reflection of their people as opposed to that ciphered, that, that look through somebody else's eyes that we always suffer from in this country. We are able to speak for ourselves. We must be self-determining to the degree that we also create and reflect for ourselves so that we get a clear image of ourselves and not somebody else's. And that was what was at the basis of this whole story, the bone of contention. Now, if you will allow me, I'll tell you what happened. Do I have time? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> the wit of the rural folk of the South is always made fun of. You know, I used to listen to LBJ and think, oh, God, he sounds so dumb. <laughs> He's speaking black dialect. But it wasn't what he was speaking. It wasn't the way he sounded. It was what he said that was important. Isn't that right? So out of this dialect, this way of speaking, comes the African tradition, the African tradition of uh, of uh, keeping down hostility between people is a way of what we call the dozens and other things like that is a way of keeping down hostility so that it becomes a kind of traditional way to talk. You talk against each other, but you must be swift enough to cap the other person. You know what capping is? You have to be able to put somebody down better than they put you down. That was the tradition. And so in this tradition comes a kind of sophistication that goes much deeper than what we have recognized in minstrelsy. The capping, the putting down was a way to show how well I can think. And in fact, if you look at folklore, black folklore, what you will learn is how sophisticated these people and their culture were. The same people that we think sound ignorant were not ignorant at all. The same people that we keep testifying or saying had no culture or anything to work with, worked with what they had and brought it to bear on their culture so that they kept what they remembered of the African tradition and that was enough to create something quite sophisticated. Now, in Zora Neale Hurston was one of the greatest writers that I've ever read in my life. She was funny and she was witty and she had a special talent of hear, being able to hear what people said as opposed to just hearing the sound of it. She could hear what they said, and she could repeat it. Having that kind of knowledge gave her the capacity to write what these people actually said, which wasn't being done, but Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes knew that just writing it and tr reading it from a book was not good enough. You had to hear it in order to understand what was underneath what the people were saying and doing. And so as they corresponded, they decided that they would create the first folk drama in the United States. Ah, I don't know how to tell you exactly. You know, we have a tradition here which we call black theater. And it is a theater of mugging and, you know, making faces and doing all kinds of things coming out of the minstrel tradition because we have not understood clearly what was underneath 
what the people in, uh, uh, in folklore really created. But Zora Neale Hurston knew from the very beginning. Now, many people did not like her because she knew and because she took pride in the folk culture that she came out of. And they didn't like it at all. My own mentor, who was a very great woman and was the first person to receive Zora Neale Hurston when she came to New York, Zora Neale Hurston lived with my mentor, told me that she was just loud. And yet, she had a proper respect for Zora Neale Hurston because she read what Zora Neale Hurston wrote after. The thing about Zora Neale Hurston was, was not only could she hear what her people were saying and record it and get it down and reflect it the way it really was, but she knew that it wasn't enough just to write it. The awful thing about the bone of contention is that both Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes had a mentor. Her name was Charlotte Mason. She was a very rich, radical white woman for her time. She thought that black people represented a kind of primitiveness that the world needed, primitiveness. Zora Neale Hurston wanted the money. Langston Hughes needed the money. Mrs. Mason was perfectly willing to support both of them as long as they did exactly what Mrs. Mason told them to do. <laughs> After a while, Langston Hughes got really kind of fed up with it. He liked Mrs. N Mason, but he could see the racism from her point of view. Always he represented the primitive. Now, that's the last thing that Langston Hughes really represented. He represented black people really at their very best. And so did Zora Neale Hurston. So what happened was there was a disconnect between Langston Hughes and Mrs. Mason, and it was about the time of the mountain, that mountain speech that he wrote. And Mrs. Mason decided to cut him off, and Zora Neale Hurston wanted to be maintained by Mrs. Mason and would do anything to make certain that she continued to get the money. To be mentored is a bad thing for some artist folks because you have to do what your mentor wants you to do or else you are not mentored. And that's what happened between the two of them and there was an explosion. They were working on this play which would have changed for all time the presentation of folk black materials in the United States because it was coming from a different point of view a clear reflection of the sophistication and the elegance of the rural traditions. And yet, it was not brought forth because both of them got into a mess about money.